This video will go over how to kill the Ender Dragon with one arrow after it perches in Minecraft Java Edition 1.16.1. One shot was originally discovered for 1.12 by Crafter Dark. Circuit was the first to bring it to 1.16 and created the concept of perch one shot. T Wags further developed 1.16 perch one shot and was the first to perform it in real time. Chloe was the first to perform it without mods. Loth made further discoveries to help make it viable in an actual speedrun. Many, many more community members made contributions, small and large, to the development of Perch One Shot to bring it to where it is today. Making this tutorial wouldn't be possible without help from Hanabi, Circuit, Loth, Exersolver, and many others. I'm going to start off with the basic tutorial, the bare minimum you need to know to do One Shot. Then, I'm going to explain all the details about One Shot, which can be used to greatly improve consistency. There are timestamps if you want to skip around, but let's get started. Once the dragon snaps, you place these two blocks on top of the fountain. They need to be blocks the dragon can't break, so end stone or obsidian. Then, you want to hide under this block until the dragon is all the way perched. You can tell the dragon is completely perched because its body hitbox suddenly stops moving. From this point, it will fly away in exactly 5 seconds, so everything you do after this needs to be quick. First, you jump out of the fountain and pillar up two blocks. Be careful to stay outside of any of the dragon's hitboxes, because that would obstruct your block placement. You can use F5 or just stand on the back of the block while pillaring. Next, jump to the block you were hiding underneath, then jump up once more to over the center of the fountain. At this point, you're of course going to be inside the ender dragon, but you should be fine since while the dragon is perched, only the head hitbox will deal damage. Right after your last jump, go into third person, look straight down, and lower your field of view to 30. Once you unpause, start drawing your bow and sneak. You need to align yourself with the very center of the dragon, which lines up with the center of the middle scale on the dragon's back. So very carefully and deliberately move to the center of this scale. Once you're there, pause, then lower your FPS cap to 20. Next, being very careful here not to unpause, click the statistics button, then click done. You can also press shift plus tab, then space to click done, just be very careful not to do this on the main pause screen, or else you'll quit the game. Continue to press statistics, then done, until you take damage. Then, raise your FOV and FPS cap back to normal, then unpause. At this point, you either hit the one shot, or you didn't. You also get launched very high, so you need a boat to clutch. Other items, especially pearls, won't work as well. If you don't have a boat to clutch, you can launch cancel. To launch cancel, you press statistics, then done, until you take damage. Then, one extra time, press statistics, then done, then raise your FOV and FPS cap back to normal. Hold space, then unpause, and continue to hold space until you're done taking fall damage. At this point, you either hit the one shot or you didn't, and you should be safely on the ground. And that's the basics of one shot. This method will give you about a 30% success rate or 20% with launch canceling. How does one shot work? The first thing you need to understand is that the velocity of an arrow is influenced by the velocity of the player that shot it. So a higher player velocity means a higher arrow velocity. Next, the damage an arrow deals is calculated using the arrow's velocity. So a higher arrow velocity means a higher arrow damage. There is no limit to this damage. Note, this does not apply to crossbows. Crossbows shoot at a fixed velocity and do not work with one shot. While the dragon is fully perched, it may not deal damage to the player, but it does still deal knockback, just without moving the player. In other words, it increases the player's server-side velocity, which only gets translated to actual movement or client-side velocity, when the player takes damage. And arrows only care about server-side velocity, not client. The way the dragon knockback is calculated can be simplified to 8 divided by the distance between the player and the center of the dragon. Since the distance is the denominator, as it approaches zero, the amount of knockback dealt shoots up. 
So if the player gets close enough to the center of the dragon, they can gain such a high server side velocity that if they shoot an arrow, it can go fast enough to deal enough damage to kill the dragon in one shot. Note, this is an oversimplification on how dragon knockback works. Circuit has a great video on this. Go watch it for a more detailed explanation. First problem. A perched dragon is immune to arrows, so in order for the arrow to actually damage the dragon, you have to wait for it to fly away. Normally, this takes a while, which gives you time to do melee damage, but we don't want this for one shot. Luckily, there's a mechanic where if the dragon can't see the player at the moment it lands from a perch, it will fly away in exactly 5 seconds. And this is why we need to hide under a block when the dragon perches. You may be familiar with this mechanic, since it also happens if the player is just really far away from the fountain when the dragon perches. Note, this is more complicated if you care about the second perch, or any later perches. I'll explain later. Second problem. After taking damage from the dragon, you move very quickly. So, you need to shoot an arrow within the first couple ticks of those 5 seconds ending. That's why we're doing this weird pause and statistics stuff. Every time you click the statistics button, the game needs to load the statistics, so it advances the game by one frame. Not tick, but frame. For one shot, we don't really care about frames, just ticks. There are 20 ticks a second, so if we set our frame rate to 20 frames per second, then each stats advance advances the game by usually one tick. The tick we take damage is the tick the dragon flies away, and also the first tick the dragon can take damage, so this is the first tick we can unpause. Note, the game can still lag, so frame rate can still be less than 20, which can mean that sometimes a single stats advance advances the game by several ticks, which will mess you up. Keeping count of those 5 seconds is extremely useful, mostly to avoid ever pausing late, which almost always results in a failed one-shot. And there's a relatively easy way to do so. As soon as the dragon finishes perching, it starts flapping its wings, which makes a distinct noise. It flaps its wings twice a second, so 10 times before flying away. If you can keep count of the flaps, you know you need to pause before the 10th flap. The flaps will often start a little early or late, and lag can sometimes desync them. But always pausing at or before the ninth flap can be a really effective strategy to never pausing late and maximizing the time you have to line up. Technically, this makes pauseless one shot doable, but it's going to be a lot less consistent. It's a three tick window. Even if you care about RTA, I still recommend taking a few seconds to pause and stats advance, just for consistency's sake. Okay, over all the gameplay I've shown, there's been a crosshair overlay. Crosshair overlays help a ton to line up quickly, and you should absolutely use one. You want your crosshair overlay to be perfectly centered on your game window. Note that your normal game crosshair is not perfectly centered. Instead, use the F3 crosshair to set up a crosshair overlay. If you play in full screen or borderless windowed, this should line up with the very center of your monitor. If you play in bordered windowed, take special care to ensure that your crosshair overlay is centered in your game. If you have a gaming monitor, there's a good chance that it will have a crosshair overlay built in. It's fast, easy, and should be perfectly centered on the screen. You can also put a crosshair overlay over your game in OBS and look at OBS while lining up. Additionally, you can use a dedicated crosshair overlay program, of which there are many, and I'll link one in the description. These don't work in full screen though. Just please, even if you have to put tape on your monitor, use a crosshair overlay with one shot. It helps massively. Moving on. I mentioned before that while perched, only the head of the dragon can damage you. I brushed over this, but you do need to actively avoid the head of the dragon. You should build your setup oriented such that the head isn't over you when you build up. To do this, if it's a north or south facing perch, you can build the setup facing east or west, or vice versa, and the head should never be an issue. A diagonal perch is a little more complicated. There are a couple ways you can think about it. What I do is round the diagonal perch to a straight perch. For example, if the diagonal perch looks closer to an east-west perch, then build the setup facing north or south. If the dragon is perfectly diagonal, doesn't matter where you build the setup facing, but almost all dragons do lean to the left or right at least a little bit. If it's confusing at first, that's fine, you'll get it with some practice. If you find the head over you when you need to pillar, you can run a bit to the left or right before pillaring. This is slower, so not ideal, but if you need to, you can. You may think you can just squeeze by the head, 
but for the purposes of hitting the player, the head hitbox is actually expanded by a block in all directions. So you may get hit even if you don't visually touch the hitbox. Also, what I'm referring to as the head is actually the neck, but in this case, it doesn't matter. Next, why do you need to place this block, and why does it need to be after the dragon snaps? Well, it's all because you can't shoot an arrow at an entity you're inside of. You can easily test this yourself with an end crystal, you just can't shoot it if you're inside of it. More accurately though, you can't shoot the hitbox that you're inside of, and since the ender dragon has multiple hitboxes, it's just the body hitbox you can't shoot, but you can shoot other hitboxes, the head, wings, or tail. But if we just let the dragon perch normally, and we stand on the bedrock of the fountain, we're a bit underneath these other hitboxes, so the arrow is more likely to miss. But why does it need to be after the snap? Because the moment the dragon snaps is the moment it chooses the height it's going to land at. This height is the height of the highest block on 0, zero. If you place the block after the dragon snaps, it will just ignore the block that you place and fly through it. This is good because it means the height the dragon perches at remains the same, but it lets us stand a block higher. If you were to place a block before the dragon snaps, then the dragon would simply choose to perch a block higher, and the relative height between the player standing on the block and the perched dragon would be the same as if there were no blocks at all. Not useful for us. On a related note are misses. Sometimes your arrow will just not hit any hitbox on the dragon. This happens around 10 to 20% of the time, and if it does happen, there's nothing you can really do about it. You can try and offset yourself towards a hitbox, basically placing yourself in between the center of the dragon and like the head, for example, but I'm not sure how effective that is. The setup I taught in the beginning is the pillar setup. It's the one I use, I think it's the best. But there is another setup, the staircase setup. To build it, place a block on the ledge of the fountain, then against the torch, then these two blocks up top, fall down, then you place two blocks above you, off to the side, to hide yourself from the dragon. It's important to place these two blocks to the left or the right of the staircase, depending on where the dragon's head is going to be. You hide here, waiting for the perch, then when it's time, you can just run up the staircase and do everything else the same. Objectively speaking, it's a little bit better, but it has different strengths and weaknesses. With the staircase setup, you need to be able to predict where the head of the dragon will end up, and it's much less forgiving if you can't, because you don't place any blocks after the initial setup. For the same reason though, it's a little bit faster and easier after the dragon fully perches. The differences between staircase setup and pillar are extremely minor, so what you decide to use comes down to preference. You can also make your own setups or variations if you'd like. Just make sure that the one block directly above the center of the fountain is there after the dragon snaps. And it's also not so obvious, but blocks at the same height as the top bedrock will sometimes get broken by the dragon, so ideally they're a dragon immune block. The next thing you need to know about is bonking. What is bonking? So you're getting the server side velocity, right? Well on the server, this means you're actually moving. Each tick of the server is moving you to where you should be given your server velocity. But since you haven't gotten hit yet, it puts you back. What this means is that on the server side, if when you're getting launched, you're hitting something, say an obsidian pillar, you lose your velocity on the server side. The arrow only cares about server side, so if you bonk, your one shot will fail. Bonking is completely random if you do the basic method, but I do go over mitigations later. Bonking does have one more quirk, and that's that the server doesn't move you in a diagonal line. First, it moves you along the y axis, then either the x or z axis, whichever has more velocity, then finally the remaining axis. So you can bonk on a tower to the east or west, or the x axis, but still have enough velocity to the one shot if the towers to the north or south are smaller. This means that the layout of the pillars matters a lot. Some pillar layouts may be very forgiving and unlikely to bonk on, but other layouts may be much more prone to bonking. Next, why does launch cancelling work? If you go an extra tick, but don't hold space, you get launched up. If you hold space, but don't go an extra tick, you get launched up. But if you go forward an extra tick after taking damage and hold space when you unpause, you don't get launched up. This is because the dragon gives you velocity in between ticks, so when you get hit, the game doesn't register that you're not on the ground anymore, so you can still jump the next tick to override your vertical velocity from the dragon before the game catches up. Also, if you stop holding space too early, this happens. Just keep holding space and it won't happen. 
The downside of launch canceling is that you lose a lot of your velocity. This is why I recommend to only do this if you don't have a boat to clutch with. Speaking of clutching, with one shot, it's complicated because on the server side, you have tons of upwards vertical velocity even as you're falling. This means that pearl clutching is only possible if you pearl against an obsidian pillar, then block clutch. Pearling on the ground as you normally would will never work. Water bucket clutching will also be harder and less consistent, though I don't fully understand why. Ladder clutching is an option, since it isn't affected by the upwards velocity, but it's not consistent when falling from this height, and it's very difficult as well. This leaves boat clutching as the only consistent option, so you should just boat clutch if you can. If you attempt to launch cancel, but you stop holding space and get launched up late, your velocity is normal as you're falling down, so you can clutch normally. You shouldn't normally be in this situation, but sometimes it will happen even if you do continue to hold space, so it's good to know. Okay, finally, Alt F3. It brings up two graphs, an FPS graph and a TPS graph, or ticks per second. The TPS graph is really how you can increase your consistency, since when you get a high velocity, you lag the internal server and the TPS decreases, resulting in the graph spiking. Using this information, you can know if you're bonking. And where it really gets useful is that you can use this information as feedback. If you don't have velocity, move to somewhere where you do have velocity. What a good spike looks like is hardware dependent, so you need to get a feel for it through practice. A couple things to keep in mind. First, if you have momentum when you pause, you may continue moving while stats advancing and lose your spike. Second, even if you have a spike, your arrow can still miss. Not much you can do about this. Third, occasionally you will have a massive spike and your arrow will do like five damage, and I'm not sure why. So the hard part is getting a spike in the first place, and there aren't really any formal methods to do so. Personally, I kind of circle around the center of the scale, but you can do it however. It's important to note that the TPS graph is delayed by quite a bit, so it's very easy to accidentally overshoot a spike. So if you're moving around and see a spike on the TPS graph, you need to go back to where you were a fraction of a second ago. I don't know exactly how much the TPS graph is delayed by, and it's very likely hardware dependent, so again, you need to get a feel for it on your own. Finding a spike may feel impossible at first, and that's because it's difficult. It's a skill. You can get extremely good at finding spikes, and your consistency will directly reflect that. If you don't intend to practice one-shot much, you're likely better off doing the basic strat of going to the middle. If you do practice and get good at using the TPS graph, then you can see a success rate of 50% or even more. I really cannot overstate the importance of practicing one-shot. A lot of what I just explained in the Alt F3 section may be confusing, because it is, and it will only start to make sense when you practice yourself. How much you should move around by, where you should move to, how to read the TPS graph, all these things you just get a feel for by practicing. I wish I could give more precise instructions, but they don't really exist. You're going to get different advice from anyone you ask, so you just need to practice. What I say next won't make much sense unless you watch this circuit video. I mentioned it earlier, it's only 3 minutes long, it's linked in the description, go watch it now. Back? Good. That yellow spot is what I've been referring to as the center of the dragon throughout this video. It's often referred to as the tickle spot of the dragon. This is the true center of the knockback calculation, but it's usually misaligned with the very center of the visual dragon model that you see. There's a mod, I'll link it in the description, that lets you see this yellow spot. I highly recommend playing with it for a few minutes to get a feel for where the real center of the knockback usually is, and it can be pretty far away from the visual center of the dragon. I talked about 5 second flyaways earlier, but I did simplify a bit. I didn't talk about how they work for perches other than the first perch, and the behavior is a little weird. To explain, I'm going to be leaning on the MCSR wiki page on the dragonfight mechanics, which I'll link in the description. Read it if you want more detail. When the dragon lands on the fountain and there is a player within 20 blocks of the dragon, it does a vision check on that player. A vision check succeeds if the dragon has line of sight of the player, and fails if it does not. The result of the first vision check is then used for all future vision checks, regardless of if there's actually line of sight. But if the dragon gets unloaded, for example by the player dying and re-entering the end, the result of the first vision check can get overwritten. If a player passes the vision check, the dragon behaves like you may normally expect, for example like with a one cycle. It rotates towards the player, fireballs, and flies away after either taking enough damage or a long time has passed. A slow flyaway. 
If a player does not pass the vision check, the dragon will not rotate nor fireball, and it will fly away in exactly five seconds after landing. A five second fly away. Okay, but what happens if the player isn't within 20 blocks of when the dragon lands? Well, after five seconds, the dragon will do a vision check on any player within 150 blocks. If no players pass the vision check, the dragon flies away. If a player does pass the vision check, the dragon will fly away and charge that player. So what does this all mean for one shot? If you miss the first perch, but you still want to one shot on a later perch, you need to make sure that a vision check does not pass. If a vision check ever passes, you will get a slow flyaway forever. What if you don't hit the one shot on the first perch and want to try again? Well, a vision check should have already run and failed, which is good. It means the dragon will always five second fly away. The only other thing that matters is the block on the top of the fountain. Remember that the dragon chooses the height it lands at the moment it snaps. It does this every time it snaps. So after a failed one shot attempt, you want to break this block and replace only after the dragon has snapped again. There are a bunch of things I want to mention that don't really fit anywhere else, so here they are. First is north-south offsetting, or Z offsetting. If you look at the layout of the towers, there aren't any directly north or south, or positive or negative Z, of the fountain. So the idea is that you try and make it so that your Z velocity is the greatest, so that you don't bonk on any towers. I have not found success with this method, and I think that's because the variance in the tickle spot is always too great to have enough velocity to one shot and avoid having too much X velocity. Also, I don't do this because I use Alt F3, so my position is dictated by the TPS graph. Next, before people realized you could just place a block here, people would jump around the 8th or 9th flap before pausing. I believe this decreases your velocity by around the same amount as launch cancelling, and it also makes launch cancelling impossible, and it's just very inconsistent. But it's better than being super low and probably missing, so if you find yourself in a situation where you don't have a block on top of the fountain, or maybe you placed obby there and need to try a second perch one shot, whatever it may be, jumping is a good backup strat. Random thing, but when you pause with a bow, the bow stays drawn, and the instant you unpause, it shoots. But if you right click the instant you unpause, the bow stays drawn. This doesn't matter much, since you don't need a fully drawn bow for one shot, but having a fully drawn bow for a crit chance does technically help your odds a little bit. Okay, in 1.16.4, a change was made that makes one shot a lot more difficult. So in 1.16.1, if your distance to the dragon is exactly zero, then the game, to calculate knockback, will divide by zero, which would crash the server. This won't ever happen when you're doing one shot in survival, but if you're using commands with the dragon, it may be an issue. For this reason, Mojang set a minimum distance for the knockback calculation, but the way they did it was weird. To one shot in 1.16.4 plus, the player needs to be standing at an extremely precise distance from the dragon, and the arrow needs to hit the head of the dragon. This time, head actually means head. It's still possible, just much more difficult. And to be very clear, Mojang did not patch one shot. They fixed a crash. Another thing I should mention, if you're dead on the tickle spot, the game might do this. SRIGT counts during this time, but the time doesn't actually count towards your run's final time. It will get manually retimed. If you really lag the game, it might stay on this screen for a very long time. I believe you can always wait this screen out, though you may opt to force quit your game if you're not in a real run. To learn and practice one shot, I don't recommend using end fight or one cycle practice maps, since they don't work well with one shot. What I do recommend is Nox Mini Practice Kit, or MPK, since the dragon will be entirely vanilla. You can use it to you get used to an entire end split, or use it to cut to the chase. You can also use it on a set seed. I'll link MPK below. People practice also works well, but only for random seed. For either, you can use the insta perch command, but you can replace dragon phase 2 with dragon phase 3, which makes the dragon snap immediately and start perching. The rotation will often be weird, which is bad for one cycling, but doesn't matter for one shot, at least not that I know of. If you have any questions, you can leave a comment and I'll try my best to respond. Feel free to DM me on Discord as well. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see more runs with one shot.